All right. So welcome everybody to the January Lifestyle Medicine Grand Rounds. Uh, this is a co-production of the Rochester Lifestyle Medicine Institute and IHA in uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan. And we actually have two IHA panelists with us tonight, Dr. Bob Brakey, if he could wave, and Dr. Melissa Sunderman, if she could please wave. Excellent, thank you. And then Dr. George Guthrie is our guest panelist former president of American College of Lifestyle Medicine and venerated uh, uh, expert in lifestyle medicine. And we're so happy to have him. And then Dr. Andy Goodbread will be presenting the case. Dr. Goodbread, I'll just introduce really quickly. Uh, he is uh, at St. Luke's University Health Network in Eastern, uh, East Dunn, Pennsylvania. Uh, actually, I've got a slide of that, don't I? Let me, let me, here we go. Let me go to the next slide, here we go. And you can see his biography right there. And um, so uh, he has prepared a, a, a very interesting case for us tonight. We really appreciate him doing that. Um, Dr. Susan Friedman is uh, uh, my partner in crime here in Rochester, New York at Rochester Lifestyle Medicine Institute. She's also a professor of medicine at U of R Medical School, uh, Medicine and Dentistry. And um, I'm not gonna read the whole thing because it would take too long to get through everybody's bio. Um, other than to say she was the lead author on uh, the uh, white paper from the uh, American Geriatric Associate. Uh, help me help, help me out, Susan. I'm stumped here. I'm blocking. The American Geriatric Society. Thank you, AGS. Thank you very much. And my computer is beeping. There we go. And I just want to go. Okay, here's Dr. Guthrie, uh, board certified in family me uh, medicine and a member of the academic program at Advent Health Center for Family Medicine in Winter Park, Florida where he trains medical students with a focus on community and lifestyle medicine. Dr. Guthrie has helped to develop several lifestyle change programs, including the Complete Health Improvement Program, or CHIP, which is the um, oldest and kind of most famous of the lifestyle medicine programs, and then Wellspring Diabetes Program and Advent Health's Creation Health Program. And he's also, as we know, active uh, in the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. So I am going to just say a couple of words about um, Rochester Lifestyle Medicine Institute. We run these... Uh, 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 lifestyle Medicine Grand Rounds every month, and it's been uh, a lot of fun. We started last fall, and uh, we look forward to other people um, uh, volunteering to present cases, and if anybody's interested in uh, being on a panel, let us know as well. This is accredited for one CME tonight through the Rochester uh, Academy of Medicine, and just be sure you fill out the uh, uh, survey at the end, and you will be able to print out your certificate. So now I'm going to unshare and I'm going to allow Dr. Goodbread to share. All right. Great. And that allows me to see all the participants, which is really fun for me. Oxford, Michigan, Brighton, Michigan. Great. Okay. All right, Dr. Goodbread. And uh, as he uh, turns that into a display. We'll let him give a presentation and there's going to be a few polls throughout this presentation and we'll stop for discussion uh, at various times. So take it away, Dr. Goodbread. All right. Thank you, Dr. Barnett. Just want to make sure that this is visible and y'all can hear me. Perfect. All right. You can see me and hear me, which my wife would say isn't necessarily a good thing, but I guess we'll, uh, we'll take it from there. So thank you guys for inviting me to present this case. And I'll admit, as a recovering football player, this is like one of those cases that you put on your college recruitment film. Like it's one of the ones that goes well, so you wanna make sure that people get to see it. So uh, I'm really excited to share it with y'all. All right, let's make sure we can advance slides here. And the, the title we came up with here is At the Helm, and that's Fostering Patient Self-Efficacy to Maintain Healthy Lifestyle Change. So before we get started, just a couple of thank yous. First, a thank you to the Rochester Lifestyle Medicine Institute for hosting this and for asking me to be a part of tonight's presentation. To the network where I work, St. Luke's, where I trained and now where I've been working for the better part of the last decade. To our residents and faculty at the program, who, without whom I wouldn't have a job. And uh, I love every, every minute of what I do every day. <clears throat> and certainly Dr. Megan Grega, my wonder twin power in uh, lifestyle medicine education at the at St. Luke's, and she has been wonderful and instrumental in being part of the implementation of our lifestyle medicine curriculum. And then finally, the, the Mrs. Goodbread, my lovely wife, who is keeping the pediatric chaos to a low din so that y'all can hear me whether you want to or not. All right, let's get rolling. So really excited <clears throat> to share with you the case of 
a gentleman who, who for his protection, I have named Steve for tonight. So Steve first came to me as a 50 year old school guidance professional with a medical history remarkable for uh, significant obesity type, <clears throat> pardon me, type two diabetes, hypertension, sleep apnea, nephrolithiasis, hyperlipidemia, major depressive disorder and generalized anxiety disorder with occasional panic episodes. And Steve had come to me uh, by recommendation of a friend who's also engaged in lifestyle medicine because he was looking for somebody who wasn't necessarily going to continue to only escalate medication dosages rather than talking about some of the underlying issues that affect the management of his condition. So, of course, I was excited and uh, this is one of those no pressure kind of moments as a doc. So his past medical history is remarkable just for what we discussed on the last slide. He'd had a history of a carpal tunnel release, several lithotripsies, and a colonoscopy a couple of years prior with two polyps with a plan to repeat in one year. His family history was remarkable for, for diabetes in mom's family and heart disease in dad's. And his social history, uh, he is a, uh, a single a heterosexual male school guidance counselor who does not smoke very occasionally has an alcoholic drink on holidays and occasionally uses marijuana to try to calm himself down. So we'll start with our, our first poll question. So what information would be most impactful for you all in deciding what to do next of the following options? And that's Steve's current lifestyle pattern, vitals and exam, last and current labs, PHQ-9, GAD-7 score, or his medication list. All right, if our engineer could put up the poll, there it is. Okay, if everybody could please answer, choose one. Okay, most uh, have answered, maybe another 10, 15 seconds. Uh, I think that's been enough time. Okay. All right. Dr. Goodberg, what do you think about that? Yeah, interesting. You know, I think all these polls are there. This is not a uh, one right answer sort of thing. I think it's nice reflection on just getting people's input. What would be the first thing they would want to know when making, making next decisions uh, for this individual? Sure. Dr. Guthrie, what is your re reaction to this? Well, when I pushed the button, I put medication list, but I did that because that was his chief complaint. I want to get my medications down. So if I'm going to play this game, I need to know what his priorities are. So that's kind of where I would go. And mm -hmm. then uh, I might ask him something like, so which medications do you think are the ones most likely to be taken away or which would you like to have gone first? So then I can move towards that and kind of mo use that for motivation. Interesting, yeah. Dr. Sunderland, Sunderman, and you're muted. I, I, I chose um, current lifestyle pattern, although I totally agree with what Dr. Guthrie was saying is that Again, we want to empower our patients and taking at the helm. So that's a really good point to see what his, what he feels are his priorities. I said the, I want to get more history. And I think that's what differentiates us as lifestyle medicine physicians from uh, maybe other physicians who are not lifestyle medicine is that our history is so much more encompassing, right? And, and really wanting to touch on those six pillars uh, of lifestyle medicine. So going more in depth into nutrition, and activity and sleep and stressors. So I think I want to do a more thorough history um, and trying to, to get more um, information regarding those pillars of lifestyle medicine before moving on. Interesting. And Dr. Brakey. Uh, I picked labs because uh, if I'm going to decrease his meds, if I'm going to help his history, I got to know where his current kind of state objective measures are, but clearly all of these are important. You know, it's like, uh, I know Dr. Bedbread's trying to kind of tease us like, okay, where are you going to start? And uh, they're all important. So uh, I, I could make an argument for any of them. All right. All right. Thank you. May Mom? I ask a question? Oh, sure. Andy, are you using the uh, ACLM 
history, like long history when a patient comes in? So uh, not on the initial visit, right? So uh, unless a patient is very specifically uh, coming in for a scheduled lifestyle medicine centric visit, uh, as of right now, we're not administering long, long form. So as this was my first time getting to know this gentleman, it was a slow play first visit rather than give him the, uh, the long form and have him say, check please, uh, before we even get into the exam room. So you're going to negotiate that long form. Which, which makes sure. a lot of sense. Thank you. For sure. Yeah, I'm just going to jump in real quickly because to answer that question, uh, Dr. Guthrie, uh, I work with Dr. Brakey and myself um, are at IHA, and we do utilize both the short form and the long form. So if we're seeing the patient initially, we will do the short form from ACLM, and that's a pretty easy two pager, right? But you're absolutely right. That long form is homework. <laughs> it's very in depth. It's wonderful, but it takes it's very time consuming both for the patient and then to go through it as the clinician. Dr. Guthrie, could you just describe that long form a little bit to us, please? Well, you know, the, the short form is just two sides of the page. The long form just goes on forever and ever. <laughs> and it, it's got a lot of questions. So I think it's very reasonable to negotiate that long form. I've actually kind of changed my pattern. When a, I see a patient for the first time, my focus is more on motivating rather than getting information. Hmm. I like to... to uh, tell the patient a, a story of one of my other patients that had a success and then say, I think we'll be able to help you with this. You know, <laughs> there's some reversibility here or remission if you want to be a little more kind of technically correct. And then with that, negotiate the, uh, uh, the long form. So that puts some hope and purpose into it, which I think makes it easier to fill out. Interesting. Oh, thank you for all that uh, insight. Uh, Dr. Goodbread, would you like to proceed, please? Of, of course, I can see that my, my master plan of uh, creating dialogue rather than board questions uh, was, uh, was successful. Huzzah. All right. So in no particular order, we'll go through all of these things, and none of them should be construed as the right answer, because I do want all the panelists to still love each other when we're done here. So, all right. So let's go back to the Slide set here. So his initial set of vitals and, and exam. So his weight was 288 pounds with a BMI of 45. His blood pressure was 144 over 82. Pulse was 80. Temperature was normal. And his exam was really only remarkable for being centripetally obese. His medication list is listed there for you. So I won't read them, but I'll give everyone a moment to review them if you would like. So we can start to target which would be our favorites to potentially try to discontinue first, which of them shows long-term benefit, et cetera. And then here's his initial set of labs, which were actually done prior to him coming to me. It was one of those, uh, he had had them drawn at the request of his last physician before he came to see me. So his A1C at the time was 6.8% total cholesterol of 155 with an LDL of 85, HDL of 51 and triglycerides of 95. That's on the previously noted statin medication. Creatinine was uh, 0.77, LFTs were within normal limits. His vitamin D was 24.4 and uh, you can see his microalbumin creatinine ratio of 154 and he's on an angiotensin receptor block. Dr. Goodbird, for the radiologists in the audience, could you please uh, explain urine microalbumin creatinine ratio? <laughs> Certainly. So that's essentially looking for the earliest detectable evidence of early renal failure, uh, most likely from a diabetic source, as evidenced by uh, very small amounts of protein in the urine. And is, was this considered, uh, how, how abnormal is this, or is this abnormal? It is mildly elevated. Okay. Thank you. His PHQ2 was zero. So uh, that's the uh, specifically as a detection tool for depression, active depression. And his uh, generalized anxiety disorder score was a 10. And of note, uh, Steve is using currently when he came to see me using diazepam twice daily for anxiety at this point as a controller. Uh, although it was initially prescribed to him for use only for panic attacks, it has become the keep the train on the rails medication for him. Moving on to his current lifestyle pattern. Again, these are in no particular order. None of these is right to collect first. 
So from a nutritional standpoint, he's eating two to three meals a day. And as he put it, trying to eat more vegetables and less red meat, he grills or bakes his food, prefers chicken and seafood. He does consume dairy, uh, currently drinking two to three cups of coffee each day. And at the time, no other sugar sweetened beverages. So he, you can tell Steve was already recognizing some things that might need to change and had probably made some implementation prior to coming to me. Uh, so that that made it a slightly easier road to hoe for sure long term, but uh, that was the, the current state we were in. From a physical activity standpoint, he had been using the Nintendo Wii. Uh, I, I do not have a financial disclosure with Nintendo to report uh, or going for a walk, as he put it, a, a few days a week without any firm routine or programming. <laughs> For his sleep, he uses his CPAP, as he said, less than prescribed, and he's still been having significant trouble falling asleep because of racing thoughts. He doesn't have any current formal process for stress management, aside from uh, the benefit that he seemed to get from his activities and, from the, and for the diazepam. In terms of his relationships, he's very close with his mother. He had recently left a romantic relationship that had been of approximately nine month duration, and he has several work friends with whom he tries to spend time. And this initial visit was pre-COVID, so those relationships uh, were in person. Uh, for our next poll question, uh, based on the information that we have, where would you, as an individual practitioner, start first? Would it be with nutrition, physical activity, Stress management, refer to bariatric surgery. If we could put that poll up, please. I can't wait to hear what everyone has to say about this. And if there's any bariatric if, surgeons in the audience. If, if we were in person, we would have to be handing out, I think, boxing gloves or foam bats for some okay. of these poll questions, but I figured we could get away with it since we're virtual. All right. And while people are thinking about their answer there, we did have a, a nephrologist in the audience post uh, the normal values for a microalbuminuria where 30 to 300 would be considered moderate. So, and what, he was 150 something? 154. Okay, and here is the result of our poll. Uh, Dr. Guthrie, what do you think about this poll? Well, I was very glad to see that nobody said bariatric surgery, so I'll, uh, I'll put a big smile on that one. Um, it's interesting because I don't know how to separate these. Uh, I chose stress management because the benzodiazepines really mess with the choice mechanism. People don't have the ability to choose, make good decisions. Their frontal lobe is blunted. And in order to uh, improve frontal lobe function, I need to increase the blood supply. So we need some exercise, right? Which will be really good for stress management. Uh, also, uh, it's fairly common for depression anxiety to come from low serotonin. Serotonin, uh, of course, comes as a, from substrate in foods. And we've got the tryptophan, which needs to make it across the blood-brain barrier. It's an insulin-dependent uh, kind of move uh, across the blood-brain barrier that requires insulin to actually work. So I want to put this patient on beans because the tryptophan to large neutral amino acid ratio is much better than it is for turkey. He'll be getting a lot more tryptophan in, and it will, because the beans release the sugar uh, slowly, the insulin will be on a low level, and he'll continue to have the neurotransmitters that he needs to kind of deal with this. And then I'm going to start kind of trying to taper that diazepam with his permission, of course, uh, recognizing how it interferes with uh, the decision making process, which he's going to need a lot of. So there, that was probably a little longer than you wanted, Ted. Oh, that's great. Thank you. I'm uh, always interested to hear what you have to say. Bob Brakey, Dr. Brakey, what do you, what is, what do you think? Well, I, I uh, it clearly, as mentioned, these are all important, and I pick nutrition. Uh, the the brain uh, decision-making is critical to this, as, as uh, Dr. Guthrie mentioned. And uh, the brain's only about 2% of the body weight, but can consume up to 25% of the energy. And in that, a lot of free radicals are formed, uh, oxidative stress, uh, and he's going to need 
not just a little less red meat and a little more vegetables, he's gonna need a shift that helps influence his microbiome, that provides antioxidant, phytonutrients, improves blood flow in order to, to get to the others. Now, again, so does uh, stress management, so does physical activity. So it, it's again, another one of those where he's given us all of the above question and trying to see what <laughs> um, yeah. But the other reason I pick nutrition, it's the most commonly misunderstood. Um, everybody knows, hey, it's good to walk more, to get activity, that stress can be counterproductive. And yet the number of patients that come in and say, boy, I, I'm glad I'm eating my chicken because it gives me good protein. And uh, I know I need to eat a few more vegetables and I'm getting my calcium from cheese. Um, it, it's one where I can make an impact on their understanding uh, most quickly. Um, so you know, that's my reasoning. Interesting. Yeah, thank you. Dr. Sunderman. So I have to go last and everyone has made such good points. Um, I want to kind of, well, they're all important. I think I wanted to double click nutrition and stress management. You know, I feel that with his GAD score of 10 and using the diazepam 10 milligrams um, twice a day, uh, he's very anxious. And I think a lot of times patients, they know how to just treat it on the spot, right? Because that's what he's gotten used to with smoking marijuana. Um, you know, when he feels like he wants to check out taking, if you can hear my dog, I'm so sorry right now. <laughs> I've got this Bernice Mountain dog. Um, and really getting him to understand what he's, to be in touch with that stress. And, um, you know, I think we'll get into it more about um, what kind of tools he can use, whether it's mindfulness, meditation, deep breathing, but absolutely right about the nutrition. So if we can get him to be more aware of his stress and more manage with that, then can focus on making smart decisions regarding nutrition. We know that, you know, I try to tell my patients about, of course, they got microbiome and that 70% uh, of our immune system resides in there. And when we're talking about inflammatory patterns, just not manifesting in pain and, and muscle aches and sore joints, but also, you know, diabetes and coronary disease and dementia, um, all of these chronic medical problems. And so really educating about the importance of getting fiber in our diet and the short chain fatty acids that are so critical to fueling our gut microbiome. So I, I think that I would want to focus on both the stress management and the nutrition and of course, put physical activity in there too. Sure. Maybe do a 15 day jump start. Absolutely. Right. Okay. Exactly. By the way, if you're going to have a, a pet with you, you have to hold them up so we can see them. Although maybe with the Bernie's um, Mountain Dog, you can He's can't... a Bernie's Mountain Dog, 120 pounds. So he would hold me up. <laughs> okay. Well, next time then. All right. Uh, and Dr. Goodbread, what is your response to this poll? Yeah, thank you guys. I, I thought it was great. Again, you're on to me with the uh, with the all of the above sort of questions. I think just generate some pretty fun conversation. And, and spoiler alert, I agree that all of them need to happen together as a package. So we'll we'll talk about that in just a second. So uh, thank you guys for your input. I, I loved hearing what you had to say. Except and, the bariatric surgery. Except the bariatric right. surgery. Oh no, I did that too. I, I, I forgot to mention that in my credentials that I, I'm one of those on the side. No, I'm just bariatric surgery. <laughs> Dr. Goodman, we had a question from the audience. That, does it matter which is the most achievable to provide the patient with an early win to provide ongoing motivation? So what about early wins? So I'll, I'll comment on that. I think that's hugely important. And we're going to actually, before we get into what I did, we're going to talk about some considerations there. And one of them is that, that confidence for change piece, right? Because again, if we prescribe only the one that we believe is going to be most impactful to their health, but that's not necessarily an aspect that they're willing to change, um, then we feel good about the recommendation and then we feel bad about the outcome. Great, great. Okay, you may proceed, please. <clears throat> Shall do. All right. So some considerations before we get into the, the bundle of things that we recommended on this first uh, visit was, well, what does Steve want, right? What, is, what are his goals? What are his priorities? Second is how motivated does Steve seem to be to make these changes, particularly as we get into the individual pillar-based changes that we may recommend? Where does Steve feel he's most willing and able to make the change, as, as was mentioned in that question? And then another question from the provider mindset is, which of the interventions, if you had to choose just one, is likely to have the broadest impact? So just some things to just do over. So I then had a conversation with Steve and tried to highlight all of these points. 
And he said, and I believe, believe me, this is a real case, I promise. He said that his main goal was to get better control of his mood and his anxiety with less of the medication use in terms of the diazepam and to ideally reduce the overall number of medications he's on for his other conditions as well. So get better control of that mood and anxiety, reduce the diazepam and reduce medications overall. And he said he's motivated enough to change PCPs to find this approach and he's willing to make quote whatever changes you recommend doc and i have been called worse so i uh, i said i i sir let's rock and roll uh, and when i asked him to do the confidence and readiness scales he said that he was uh particularly when we talked about just overall willingness to make some changes and then we drilled down into individual pillars uh how how ready are you to make a change he said he was a 10 and how confident are you that you'll be able to make a change? And particularly when I said uh, to your nutrition, he said, doc, I feel pretty darn good. I feel like I'm at about an eight. And as we know from the evidence, anything at or above a seven is uh, is cooking with gas for, for the right uh, place to be ready to make some change. To which I responded after getting those responsive is this real life? Can this be true? Can this individual really be this ready and confident for making some change? Uh, and that's also, I think, how most of the residents look when I am giving a talk. So I apologize. All right. Um, so uh, just to, to keep moving here. So what, what did I what did I do first? Uh, and uh, in no particular order, but it is a bundle of three things we did on this first visit. So for nutrition, my considerations were that right now his A1C is decent on a bunch of medications. His lipid panel is also in pretty good, pretty decent range at the moment because of the rosuvastatin. He, he by himself is doing a fair job with nutrition. So rather than make a sweeping change or recommend a sweeping change that will re remove things from his approach, let's add something and then just slowly reduce some less healthy things. Uh, and as though I had studied Dr. Guthrie for the test, I added some beans. So what we did was I said, uh, I said, Steve, <laughs> over the course of the next week, let's add a total of five cups per week. And since you're not currently in a relationship, that shouldn't affect your social life at the moment. I'm kidding. I'm sorry. And I did recommend that he reduce the full fat dairy to no more than once per week, trying to be as uh, smart with our goal as we could. I uh, asked him to continue to steer clear of sugar sweetened beverages. So don't replace dairy with soda. Uh, and of note, we did also replete his vitamin D along with nutritional counseling on how he could keep the tank full once we filled it. So thinking along the same lines of healing the gut to heal the serotonin production uh, and also uh, improve his glycemic index we added those beans dr guthrie uh, yeah I, I when a patient's come, uh, worry about gas i uh, try to bring a smile to their face and i say to them haven't you heard to air is human nice <laughs> <laughs> nice yeah. i'm going to write that down that's going to go into um the, the, the history books nice maybe it's just the sports back in me but i just tell people they'll be able to run faster no <laughs> Um, um, from a stress management standpoint, this has the potential for big impact for all the reasons that my uh, much more intelligent panelists already talked about. So his stress and anxiety are currently poorly controlled. He's taken a lot of diazepam that was originally supposed to be an emergency medicine. And as we know, the stress isn't helping his weight and his blood sugar. Um, we don't need to get into cortisol metabolism or it'll be a three hour thing. Uh, and he did specifically mention this on being one of his points of focus. So, so what do we do? I recommended a particular mindfulness app. I left the name off of here because I just didn't want to uh, start throwing names around unless we're asked uh, to, to be used five minutes daily with a focus on the breathing exercises. Since I thought that not only would this be useful for overall uh, parasympathetic tone, but it can be really nicely used in the moment if he's having a panic episode. So rather than focusing on some of the guided meditations to start, let's use some of the things that you can feel work in the moment and that you can use even when somebody's stressing out at work. Dr. Guthrie? Yeah, I was going to add here, this guy is a, a, a guidance counselor in a high school. He's hiding his Valium use. I mean, he's got an internal mo uh, motive to get off of this stuff. And I'm, I'm, you know, it makes it much easier to approach. It can be very difficult sometimes. Hmm. Thank you. And I, I'd even mentioned to him, if these breathing exercises work for you, these are things that you can take to the students that you work with 
uh, which uh, which just tried to just tried to nudge the the professionalism lever a little bit for him as well. And I did suggest that uh, he potentially reconnect with a therapist that he had been connected with uh, years remotely to consider some CBT based therapy. And then finally, for this first visit, again, he was motivated enough that I felt like I could throw in the trifecta. So I, I did uh, make some physical activity recommendations. He's doing some moving already, right? So this isn't a, a brand new overcoming total inertia sort of thing. Uh, so I, I just talked about doing some movement and activity. Uh, I'm sorry, he had already been doing some movement and activity a few days a week, mostly Nintendo Wii or walking. I'll take it, right? It's a great start. Uh, so my recommendation was to increase his physical activity to uh, 30 to 45 minute sessions at least five days each week, which is not a substantial increase in the duration of bouts that he had been doing, just making it more structured and more frequent. Uh, and I asked him to spend at least some of that time in the moderate intensity range. And I explained the sing talk test to him uh, to gauge what moderate uh, activity means. Do you mind just review that test? Yeah, so, so it's, a, it's a cool one because it changes with your fitness level, right? So um, light activity is a degree of activity where you can both sing and speak in a complete sentence. Um, doing both at the same time, I guess, would be rapping. But uh, you, you, the intensity is such that you can do both. Uh, moderate level of activity is you can't necessarily sing anymore but you can speak in a complete sentence. And then vigorous activity is such that you can't do either comfortably, right? Um, without getting into ventilatory thresholds and all that. So that's a nice one because folks tend to understand it, whether you want to hear them sing or not. Um, and it does change along with their fitness level so that it, it that test will hold up even as their VO2 max improves. Got it. Dr. Guthrie. I was just going to add, I, I really commend this because I, I think it's important. One of the most common things that happens with exercise is people hurt themselves and then the, the whole thing stops. So now you're using kind of the uh, keeping him in aerobic so he's not pushing too hard. He's not going to have the aches and pains. Uh, when you build up lactic acid, it depresses endorphins. Although when people are walking outside, I call them outdorphins. Okay. But when you move, you're moving, you're losing your endorphins, you're not enjoying the exercise. If you are able to enjoy them, you'll be back the next day. You want to do it. And that's really the goal is to get safe, uh, regular exercise going. So thank you for letting me make that comment. Sure. <clears throat> All right. Uh, actually, um, Dr. Goodber, there is a little question in the chat about um, this patient's why. why. Why now? Why is he? Do you know why he came to you at this point? And was there some overarching existential or self-actualizing goal? Um, I wish I could say that there was. I think it just so happened that he got together with the friend of mine or uh, the colleague of mine who recommended me. Maybe he was just shooting the breeze and mentioning his frustration at his current uh, situation. But no, there was no like bat signal in the sky with a G for my name or anything like that. Although we're working on that on the roof. Um, no, I, I think for him, it was meeting the right person at the right time and being frustrated with where he was. Got it. Okay. Thank For some you. people it's turning 50. Ah, uh, yeah, it did just turn 50, didn't it? Kind of a sense that you're yeah, uh, kind of uh, half done or, or more and mm. the best of the rest. So I don't, just a thought. Good thought, yeah. But I think that's a good point Dr. Revy made is you, you can say his reason is he wants to get off medicines, but why is that? And then why is that? And, you, and as you get down to the deeper layers, it allows you to say, how am I going to really get to his true needs? Uh, because sometimes what they present with is uh, a, a, what they think is gonna get him to their true needs. And it may be, uh, or there may be some other levers you discover in the process. I just wanna make a quick comment about movement. And I love Dr. Goodbread that um, I like to frame it rather than exercise as movement because there's so many different forms of movement, right? Who would have thought Nintendo Wii, right? That's usually not a common one that in our generation that comes up. And so when we look at the blue zones, they move. They don't go to the powerhouse gym and lift heavy weights or take hit classes, right? They move, whether it's gardening, whether it's walking to see uh, their friends or um, you know going on a walk. So I think that this is a really good point in that 
we just want our patients to move and people can be creative and find something they like to do. You like to hula hoop, go hula hoop. You like to dance, go dance. So just reframing that sometimes there's a negative connotation to exercise and it feels like a chore. It feels like, uh, I don't want to exercise and negativity. So this really um, accentuates how there's many forms of movement and we don't care what it is. Just move your body. Very good. All right. Shall we proceed? Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you so much. Just a real quick, Dr. Brakey, thanks for, awesome. for drilling down on that keep asking the why question, because uh, we're going to touch on it in a couple slides. But for him, it was he was starting to feel out of control, right? Like he he didn't feel that he had any control anymore of where his medical future was headed. It was escalating medication doses. And so he really was looking for a, a hand on the reins or a hand at the helm, so to speak. All right, so you look at all the things I've done so far and you might be thinking to yourself, dang, that's a lot to recommend to this individual. And a lot of that came from the, the perception that he was really in it to win it. He was engaged and by looking for that early win, by giving him some opportunities for some achievable goals, uh, we could get that early win and use that as a, uh, as a linchpin for, for future, future goals. So would, would we make this strength of recommendation uh, in someone with less motivation? Likely not, but that's a poll question for another time. All right, so, so in the words of Iago, how did it go? So I saw Steve for a pre-op evaluation a couple of months later. So it was before our, our planned visit to go over how things were going. Um, he came in for a pre-op and he had already adopted nearly all of what we had talked about. Uh, and we didn't check any new labs or make any significant reassessment at that point uh, in the interest of kind of letting the interventions work, letting things brew before we uh, gauged how far we've come. But he had already uh, at that point was seven pounds down at 281 pounds with a blood pressure of 130 over 80. And I said, okay, Steve, just keep doing what you're doing. Have a great operation. See you in a month. So the follow-up visit was at, at the four month mark after our first visit with a couple of just brief electronic check-ins, uh, again, trying to, trying to let him be him. And so far what he had done, he had added the legumes as recommended. He was down to eating dairy once a week and using less cream in his coffee. He was exercising as we described up to six days a week because he said, quote, I wanna be an overachiever. And most of it was at the moderate intensity, uh, talkable but not singable intensity level. He was using the app that we discussed for breathing and he had actually gone back and started seeing that therapist. So outcomes, he had been uh, reducing his diazepam as we had implemented the changes that we discussed. He was now using it less than once a day. He was using breathing and de-escalation techniques uh, in times of significant anxiety and panic. So the breathing he had gotten from the app, some de-escalation techniques he had learned from his therapist. Uh, he had kind of stayed weight neutral since his pre-op. Uh, but he was uh, doing very well at that point with a blood pressure uh, of 140 over 80. So his blood pressure, I'm sorry if you guys, oh, yep, you're going to hear a couple more rings of that siren. Sorry, I live in a small town with an active fire department. Uh, so his blood pressure again had crept a little bit back up uh, from his pre-op up back up to 140 over 80. And his point of care A1C was 5.9%. Nicely done, Steve. And very most importantly, to harken back to two slides ago, he was feeling better with more energy and feeling like, as he put it, I have control of what's going on with my body, which was one of those like, okay, stay professional. Don't actually fist pump in the office because I was just so happy for him because we, uh, we had met what he was trying to accomplish. So next poll question here, uh, would you at this point discontinue any medications? Uh, and if yes, which one? Oh, we, oh, we made it into a poll. Good. Great. All right. People can choose a uh, medication they would discontinue. Feels like insider trading when I answer my own poll question. Right. Right. And while people are thinking about that, we have there's always a comedian in every bunch. So the question was, um, was that pre-op for bariatric surgery, by any chance? I can neither confirm nor deny. No, okay. it, it, it was not. It was not. I, if I remember, it was a cataract. 
Cadillac. Okay, very good. All right, have we got the answer, engineer? Actually, this one's taking a little bit longer. Okay. All right. Yeah, and and of course, people do recognize that this is multiple. You can you can put in more than one. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, we're, we're still only at 63 and we were over at 80 for the others. So people are still thinking. All right. Um, so uh, Dr. Guthrie, we, we, we love your outdoorfins. That's kind of, um, yeah, that's a hit. Yeah, I kind of like it too. <laughs> yeah, we've, got, we've gotten two great quotes from you today to air is human and outdoorfins. Very yeah, good. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> okay. I, uh, I could add one more. Okay, let's hear it. We're human beings. <laughs> okay. So we're, okay. We were made to eat those things. And I, I, I really think they're important from a lot of different uh, angles. Yeah. Agreed. You are All filling right. my, you're filling my, uh, my yeah. arsenal of dad jokes, Dr. Guthrie. My re the residents are not going to be happy. <laughs> exactly. Dr. Guthrie, what do you think about, what would you have discontinued? Well, uh, you know, you put me first every time. I would like to give Melissa a chance to be first. All right. Fair enough. Yes, let's hear from <laughs> Melissa. On mute. So, I mean, I think that in general, I would love it if he was not taking the diazepam. Although I see with a lot of my patients, there is this attachment of the safety guard that a lot of my patients just love. I mean, I want to say love. They, they feel safer just knowing it's there. Right. And sometimes they don't even take it, but just knowing that if they get into a crisis, they have something. So I feel like ideally I don't want him to have to take this anymore, but I feel like he kind of needs to have that available. So I think with the labs that we have back thus far, we've, we've had the objective data of the A1C of 5.9. It seems like he really is um, improving his diet and his exercise. So I'd like to work on one of the diabetic medications. He's on three diabetic medications. Um, so I think we've got some room to, to wiggle around with that. So I think that I would either go after the Invicana or the Trulicity. We know that those are very pricey, um, very expensive. Um, I'm going to let the metformin stay there in terms of insulin resistance. Some people have a little bit of weight loss benefit with it. And it's a very inexpensive medication. Um, so that's where I'm going to target first is de-prescribing from the, the diabetic standpoint and continuing to work on the mindfulness. It sounds like he's doing that app. He's working with a therapist. He has reduced his uh, need for the diazepam, but I think I still want him to have that as a safety net. All right. Well, let's go in reverse order this time. Let's hear from Dr. Brakey. Uh, you know, like Melissa, I, I see the progress he's made on his uh, A1C and he's on three of those meds. I, I picked the endocana. Uh, to me, this is the um, kind of the best example of treating a symptom. Um, hyperglycemia is not the, the cause or even, I mean, it's a symptom of impaired uh, insulin and as such, sugar builds up. So all this does is push it out through the kidneys. So yes, it lowers your average glucose, your A1C, uh, but I tell people that a, a big part of the problem is to help patients understand that with insulin resistance, the insulin's not working. So the cells are starving in the face of plenty, plenty of, it, of sugar going by, they can't get in. Well, you push the sugar out through the urine, the cells are still starving. You know, mm -hmm. What ultimately is the, is the root cause for the blindness, the kidney failure, the uh, artery disease, the neuropathy uh, that are the complications. Now, granted, hy hyperglycosylating every uh, equation in the body is not good as also, um, but with the A1C that low, to me, he no longer needs this expensive uh, drug that's just treating a symptom. Excellent, thank you. I, I, I feel good as a radiologist, that was the one I chose, so, okay. <laughs> Dr. Guthrie, your thoughts? Well, you know, I appreciate the uh, kind of pulling back on the uh, the uh, Indocana. It uh, is very expensive. It does provide some kidney protection. So, you know, I agree that that's one of the first ones worth taking off, especially with this A1C down. And I certainly want to uh, hang on to the uh, duaglutide because it's helping to control appetite. I really like the appetite suppression of the GLP analogs. I, to me, that's wonderful. Uh, and diazepam is the next one that I would choose. 
he's already on his way. And I have a rather interesting way of doing it. And that is, I would cut it down from 10 milligrams to five milligrams or 2.5. And then because this anxiety comes with some kind of cardiac things, sweating, I mean, it just kind of comes over people. What I've taken to doing is writing a prescription for 10 milligrams of propranolol and say, when it starts to hit you, take this, wait 10, 15 minutes. If you still need the diazepam, then you can use that. Uh, one of the things I'm doing is activating, of, of course, uh, the uh, kind of natural, uh, what's, the, what's the word we use? When we, uh, we, we activate the... Uh, uh, Somebody help us out. Thank you. So we activate the placebo effect, give it a chance to work. The beta blocker goes in rather quickly, can kind of knock that down. And I'm finding many patients are able to, oh, I didn't need it that time. So it's a way that they can still have it in case they need it, but they can also be getting off of it. And usually I give them just you know five or 10 of these uh, smaller dose diazepam and go from there. Now, the third one that I uh, also pushed here, you might be surprised at, is the allopurinol. Of course, I would like a uric acid to see that it's okay, but this guy is reversing his metabolic syndrome. And metabolic syndrome is definitely tied to allopurinol uh, the gout. I mean, they, they kind of all come together. Uh, when the uh, metabolic syndrome starts to go away, we find uh, a, an improvement in the cyclic AMP, and then you don't have the problems with the uric acid. So I'd check that level, and I would uh, kind of taper off of that because that medication came along with his metabolic syndrome. So those were the three I chose, maybe a little too aggressive, Probably wouldn't do it all in one visit, but I'd start, I'd move that way and lay it out for him. So then he can see that we're moving and we're going from, I think what's more important into uh, to uh, kind of the next easiest one. So that's kind of my perspective on it. Wow, fascinating. Dr. Goodbread, any comments before you proceed? I think we'll, we'll stage it for when we get to the decision-making slide, but all, all that made great sense. And it uh, kind of right in keeping with my thought process, okay. which I'm always going to say, because again, you guys are smarter than I am. All right, so let's keep rolling. So Steve continued his uh, lifestyle interventions and he shifted his focus because he had already been crushing it with the ones that we discussed. He wanted to reduce his breads and his grain-based pastas in favor of trying some, some chickpea or uh, black bean-based pastas, which... Uh, as a spoiler for all but the most discerning palate, it's kind of hard to know the difference sometimes. So after maintaining a sub six A1C for another six months, we stopped the canagliflozin. So we did stop the Invicana. Uh, and the decision-making there was, was very similar to what you all discussed, uh, trying to keep the ones that show either a weight maintenance, a cardioprotective, a nephroprotective, or a uh, morbidity and mortality reduction. So metformin, uh, the ARB, of course, and then the dulaglutide. Uh, th those I decided to keep on and get rid of the one that, as you said, is just uh, pushing sugar out through the kidneys. Another six months later, his A1C was down again, even despite reducing that medication uh, to 5.8%, and he remained weight neutral at that point, uh, even with, uh, and even with, for a short time, a bit of COVID-related uh, weight gain. So this gentleman implemented all of these things as COVID struck. Blood pressure at our next visit was 110 over 70, made sure he was still awake, which he was, uh, and that was uh, down from 144 over 82 at our initial visit. Steve, I mean, he's just an amazing guy. And he was only now using the uh, diazepam occasionally. I, I agree very much with what Dr. Sunderman said about it, it, it almost being like the flood insurance sort of thing is you're probably not going to need it, but gosh, if I don't have it, I'm not going to sleep at night. So I believe this is our last poll question. Uh, where would you focus next in Steve's care? Would it be on weight loss, medication deprescribing, relapse prevention plan, or retirement? All right, what do people think? Hmm.
thanks to everybody for tolerating the silliness of some of these questions. I realized when I was getting ready today that I actually made these slides while I actively had COVID a couple of weeks ago. So there may have been some COVID brain <laughs> in, in some of the jokes here. Well, we think you're doing great. Thanks. Of course, we would say that no matter what. But. No, this I realize. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got some answers here. Uh, let's talk, start with Dr. Brakey this time. Uh, you know, I picked medication deprescribing uh, because we're not really at goal. Uh, and there's a, there's a concern that people look at numbers. Wow, my A1C, my blood pressure, my weight's decreasing. I'm doing really good. But it's being propped up by an artificial uh, mechanism that has side effects, cost, uh, unintended consequences, potential interactions, um, and potential long-term effects. Um, I, again, I think that we're only still learning the long-term effects of uh, a host of medications, including many of these on. Um, people have mentioned several times the diazepam. Um, now, Librium was invented the year I was born in 1955, so we don't have a lot of experience with benzos. Valium came about in the 60s as mother's helper, and it was non-addictive, safe, helped with anxiety. And we now know that long-term use causes Alzheimer's. Well, I think we're going to continue to learn more and more about the effects of these props. So to me, relapse is important that he doesn't go back, but he's not to the point we need him to be yet. Uh, weight loss clearly too is a part of that. Um, but I, I think we might need to get rid of some of the props so that he feels a little bit of the strain again, instead of relaxing like, wow, I'm there. I, I'd almost like that A1C to go up a little more. So he says, oh, I got to do some more. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, interesting. Dr. Sunderman. So I agree with Bob, um, although I did choose the relapse prevention plan. And when we're looking at the stages of change, I think we would agree that Steve came to you, um, Dr. Goodbread, when he was in the contemplative stage, right? He was aware, he chose you because you're a lifestyle medicine physician. So he was already contemplating that. You helped him prepare. You got him to take action with what he felt the tools that he could um, take on. We got him to you know, this action plan he right now, it seems like he's been on this maintenance, right? But we know stages of change can then go to relapse, right? And if we had a, you know, telescope peering into the future, and it seems like this, you saw him kind of during COVID, right? Um, because you said that he maybe gained a little bit of weight during COVID, but, you know, look what happens during COVID of he had been a counselor at school. Well, guess what? Probably isn't in the school, is probably working from home, probably not interacting with his um, co-workers. He was exercising, going for walks, but maybe because of COVID and isolation, that's going to change. That's going to look different. Um, so I think that we really need to, you know, work with our, our patients to say it's not always going to be easy and we don't want you to become complacent. Um, so to always have goals that you're working on, you know, to be like, okay, well, I didn't go for a walk, you know, today because it was cold or because I'm supposed to, you know, not feeling well to, to know that, okay, so maybe I didn't do a great job eating or exercising yesterday or the day before, but I have to stay with my plan and you're going to have bad days or you're going to have some crises. You're going to have some unexpected, um, you know, obstacles that come up. So I think it's really important to have that plan of goal setting and being able to come back to that. So along with that stages of change, we know that relapse does happen and how to come back to, to, to action and maintenance. Thank you for that. Uh, so we got a vote for relapse prevention plan, another vote for medication deprescribing. Dr. Guthrie. Well, I went for relapse prevention as well okay. uh, as you know, the, the one right answer. I, I'm glad to see that retirement kind of didn't make the list. So we're not going to try to quit on that. And I do, uh, Andy, appreciate the, the humor, okay? One uh, crazy answer in every multiple choice question is appreciated. So for what that's worth. Uh, I was surprised that you only, you, your first visit back on this patient was planned for four months. Uh, this guy is an amazing patient, incredibly well motivated. I'm usually asking them back in two to four weeks. Uh, just, you know, see what's happening, start some feedback, start to expand. I can't download this stuff with a USB from my brain into them. So I need to kind of figure out what they have been able to do and then make some suggestions to help them progress a little further. 
I also think they need to be able to see improvement. Uh, you know, if the weight is not going down, patients will get very discouraged. Well, I'll ask them, are your clothes getting bigger? You know, that is, are they, uh, are they gaining muscle mass, losing fat, and their weight staying the same? I can emphasize that to encourage them kind of along the path. So I'm looking for uh, hurdles that they may be wrestling with. In my experience, it's really common to begin relapsing at about six months. So that's a real key time. I'm going to see somebody at that time, see how they're doing. Of course, I always want them to uh, be doing better, right? Mm -hmm. And I try to just focus on the positive things they've done. If they've fallen a little bit, well, get back on the wagon. I, I, I try not to condemn at all. I want to encourage. People do better with that encouragement. So that's that kind of relapse prevention plan is where I landed. I might throw out a carrot. Well, the next medication that we're going to be removing is, and then, you know, that can help uh, use that initial motivation and write it. Uh, and this is why we're doing it. People generally do better when they understand why something is happening. Uh, of course, another issue that you have to deal with is they saw another physician who told them they were crazy for doing this. So you kind of have to, you know, cover for that sort of a thing as well. So those are my comments. Trust they help. Thank you. How about that, Dr. Goodwood? How about uh, how long? Why did you wait four months? Yeah, so I, I, I appreciate that feedback. I actually learned quite a bit from this case in terms of uh, time in between visits. We had checked in a bit electronically, but not in person. And this may or may not have coincided directly with the ambush of COVID starting. So uh, there was a little bit of that, that that played a role in how long there was between our visits. But I, I agree, particularly in someone less motivated, particularly less motivated than Steve, seeing him more frequently would have been would have been uh, advisable for sure. Right. So we are getting uh, a little bit behind here. Uh, pick it up a little bit. We'll, we'll go over. We're, we're going to go over a few minutes. I can see we. this is a great discussion and we don't want to abbreviate this. I'll, if I don't have to. I'll blitz through. That's great. So uh, when he came to see me during that first winter of COVID, so at spring spring of 2020 was when COVID started, and it was later in in uh, in that following winter that he came to see me. He was feeling down. Work had gotten crazy back in the school. Relationships were thinned out by COVID, and he was unmotivated. He had essentially fallen off the wagon uh, on uh, nutrition and physical activity, and sleep was unshockingly becoming more of an issue. Point of care A one C had had slid back. Uh, up to 7.5 to which i responded rut row roach and the thought was okay well where, where are we where are we head next don't panic right so what we talked about was all right where, what are some of the factors that contributed here and that was a time to self-disclose right here's what i've been dealing with during covid man and we talked about what some of our mutual triggers were for either a motivation for exercise stress eating, which again, uh, I will raise my hand certainly for that one as well. And he laid out what he thought he needed to do to get back on track. Uh, because again, he seemed like a gentleman who had developed quite a bit of self-advocacy. So I said, well, Steve, what do you think needs to happen next? And I did recommend the VA's uh, CBT coach, CBTI coach app to help him with his sleep uh, to try to prevent him from going back to reaching for his medication. So Steve got right back on the horse and found that his sleep spontaneously improved just by resuming his nutrition and physical activity routine that we had uh, established before. And four months later, when we rechecked an A1C, thanks insurance, uh, it was back down to 6.2%. So we were very, very excited about that. So some takeaways. Are you okay if we move, with, move into takeaways, Dr. Barnett, just to leave yeah. some time for... Please Closing uh, conversation. Great. Sure. So my takeaways were that uh, every individual patient is going to come in with their unique blend of what they're doing already, um, what conditions they have that could be impacted by their lifestyle, what their motivations are, what obstacles they face, and what their personal goals are. And for me, identifying first their priorities and then balancing them with the priorities that I see to be most impactful from a physician standpoint and finding that middle ground, even being willing to take a step back from my own priorities to focus on theirs can really pave a pathway to a team-based conversation with the patient. And not every patient is gonna be as initially motivated to change as Steve was, but any way we can try to develop that feeling of self-efficacy, being at the helm of their own care is gonna benefit those patients no matter where they are in that readiness for change uh, spectrum. And 
that self-efficacy is not only important in starting to make change, but even more important when the adversity arises because their belief that they can maintain change is going to be immediately challenged by that backslide and feeling like they had the self-efficacy to have made the change to begin with is what's going to make getting back on the proverbial wagon uh, much easier. Great. So references that I use. And if you'd like me to unshare, I will. I will. Uh, fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, you know, we've run over time. And I, th I think we'll, uh, we're going to make an executive decision to actually add another five minutes here. Let me make a couple of announcements and then people have to leave are free to leave. And then we'll continue, uh, maybe get some, uh, some live input from the audience. Um, so we, uh, it, for those of you who've attended and who signed up, you will receive a little notification at the end of this event. Uh, and uh, it'll t uh, it will be a link to a Google form, fill out the survey and click the button at the end and you'll get your uh, CME certificate. Uh, and so we're excited about that. Next month, um, we are uh, excited that we have Dr. Alan Goldhammer will be presenting a case. People may know Dr. Alan Goldhammer from True North uh, and uh, Medical Fasting. Uh, the panel, one of the panelists will be Dr. Michael Clapper who has had extensive experience working uh, with Dr. Goldhammer uh, supervising um, the medical fasting. So a bit of a controversial area, but uh, also very exciting. So um, take a look at that. You'll, you'll be all hearing announcements about that. That's gonna be February 15th. Um, and I think that just about covers it. Um, did uh, any of our panelists wanna make any additional comments before we send it, uh, listen to people on the floor here? Dr. Guthrie, any thoughts? I, I, I'll wait to hear questions. Okay, sounds good. All right, um, so let us see here. Um, well, Dr. Berkowitz, you always have something interesting to, uh, to add. Could you please unmute yourself? We'd love to hear from you. Dr. Berkowitz. No, 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 no pressure on that one. Thank you very yeah. much. Our, our resident nephrologist here. Yes, uh, it broke my heart to see that SGLT2 go away. And why is that? Well, g g given the data on, on renal protection, but in truth, a, a guy with just microalbuminuria and a normal creatinine, yeah, there's probably not a huge bang for the buck there. And, um, you know, it, it's interesting regarding yes, the, uh, the uh, GLP-1 agonist in terms of cardiovascular protection down the line. You know, I agree with Dr. Brakey. We don't, you know, there's not a wealth of, of experience, right? This hasn't been around for 50 years. Uh, but uh, in terms of, you know, what's the greatest risk of this guy's life? And, you know, it's cardiovascular disease of one sort or another. But yeah, I guess, Dr. Brakey, you could make the argument, perhaps you will make the argument that he won't need the GLP-1 once we get him whole food plant-based and sleeping properly and exercising and weight reduction. So I, I take your point if that's, you know, if, if indeed you can confirm that to be the case. All right, Dr. Brakey, response? Uh, I, I guess, you know, we had uh, Dr. McDougall a little while back. I remember his comments like, hey, start fresh. Uh, now <laughs> he, gets people, he gets people all in on a jumpstart kind of residential uh, all in program. So we have to be careful that in real life, we do need to titrate meds down carefully. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, again, it, it's uh, both an art and a science. So thanks for your comments, Paul. Sure. Dr. Sunderman, any final uh, uh, comments you'd like to make about this case? I think this is a great case, Dr. Goodbread. Um, thanks for sharing it. And I think what's so um, rewarding in lifestyle medicine is seeing our patients, you know, that we believe in our patients, right? And then we get our patients to believe in themselves. And that's great that you did the stages of change. You also did the confidence scale. So you were able to hone in on areas that he felt confident that he could make these changes. And then he was successful. So that's where you start. And I think that, you know, I always tell my patients when they come to see me, I said, I believe in you and I want to empower you. And I'm going to give you the tools and resources to do that. And so much of um, conventional medicine is just giving pills, 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 because inciting that we don't believe that you're going to make changes, just take these pills. So I think you did a great job of getting him to, you know, to make these changes that, um, and I think down the road, these will be his lifestyle, right? So we hopefully won't have as many relapses and the, the, when he's feeling stressed instead of stressed eating or reaching for a medication, he'll go outside and get some fresh air or he'll pick up, you know, the phone and call someone. So he'll have other 
um, coping mechanisms. And that's what our goal is. And I think you've done a wonderful job. Thank you, Thank you for that, Dr. Sunderman. Dr. Guthrie, any final comments before we sign off for the night? Well, a patient like this is a rarity, kind of like looking for a diamond. I am, uh, you know, these, they're so encouraging when, when we get one. I wonder if his cousin lives in Orlando at all. <laughs> I'd love to have him come over. <laughs> you know what? I'd be I'd be willing to have my arm twisted to just bring him down there to Orlando, <laughs> just just for the sake of good quality medicine. You know, it's these patients that really motivate me. When I see the changes, I get excited and I'm ready to go out and find the next one. But so often they're not there. Mm. When I was. Uh, in grade school and to some sense into high school, my father wanted to turn me into a golfer. And uh, it wasn't always easy. You know, he would shoot 79, 80, 81, and I'm shooting 115, 125. I mean, it just never really worked. And I was a little discouraged coming off the golf course. And my father's response to me was always this, George, remember the good shots. And that's the way I approach lifestyle medicine. There's a lot to be discouraged about, but when people do something, it's exciting. And uh, that, mm -hmm. that motivates me for quite some time. And of course, encourages me to make efforts to be more effective at uh, bringing people to the point where they're ready to change. Well, thank you for those words of wisdom. And thank you all to the panelists, uh, especially to Dr. Goodbread for having done all the work to prepare this case. And um, the rest of us who got to listen and taunt you. So uh, we should all buy this book. Oh, he, uh, the last Dr. Guthrie's book. book, of course. Yeah, of that's course. Dr. Guthrie's book. Thank yeah. you very uh -huh. much yeah. <laughs> for throwing that a up. Shame, a shameless plug. Thank you so a much. Shameless Melissa. plug. We're, we're glad for patients that have been able to use it to make a difference. Yeah, great. Thank you. This, uh, this has been recorded and will be available on YouTube in a couple of days. You can uh, send it, uh, take a look again yourself or send it out to your friends. So thank you all. And thank you to our engineer, uh, Bob Frankie, and to Dr. Susan Friedman, who uh, helps uh, me keep, uh, keep this organized. And uh, also to Brian Bell, who keeps me organized. So thank you all and have a great night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Pleasure. Thanks, Seth.